You are a Locked On Braves postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Braves postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta and the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Grant McCauley and Jake Mastroianni with you after what was an important win to open up a very big weekend for the Atlanta Braves. But I think at this point, we can pretty much say they're all a big win. They're all must win for the Braves as they come down the stretch fighting for a berth in the postseason. So we've got a lot to talk about uh, when it comes to this series against the Dodgers. We've got a lot to talk about when it comes to that wild card race, and we'll get you caught up on all of that as we get going here on the Braves postcast. Before we get started, though, hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to Locked On Sports Atlanta on YouTube, and subscribe to Locked On Braves wherever you get your podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on MLB. Use the code locked on MLB, all lowercase, to win $50 instantly when you play $5. Well, Jake, the Braves definitely needed to set the tone for this weekend. They got timely hitting. They got great pitching. That, as we know, is a recipe for good things to happen, and the Braves have some good things going, and the weather was able to hold off on Friday. I'll throw that one in there as well. Yeah, good night for the Atlanta Braves, obviously bouncing back from the loss on Wednesday and kicking off this series on a, on a good note when a series, you know, it's going to be a tough one coming in. I mean, looking at it on paper, you're kind of just hoping to get a split of it, but you go ahead yeah. and take care of getting that first one done and see where you can go from here. Yeah, I mean, you have to win a couple to you know take that split. So certainly he'd like to take it in game one and set that tone. And that, I think, is what really the Braves were able to do in this one. Quick scoring for Atlanta, grabbing a first inning run, but then getting to the youngster Landon Knack for four runs in the second inning. Braves flexing their muscles, a couple of home runs in that frame. And the pitching carried them the rest of the way. I know they added on a little bit late as well with an extra run. But as I said, this is the formula and the offense. That's the part of it that has been a little bit harder to come by. So great to see it show up early, especially against a team as powerful as the Dodgers, which we know we're going to talk about, was going to be a tall task for the Braves pitching staff and particularly the rookie who's on the mound. Great to jump out to an early lead, obviously, in a game like this, in a game where, as you mentioned, the weather, too. You didn't know if they were going to get all this one in. So being able to get out to that early lead certainly helped in that regard. But with that good Dodgers offense, you know you're going to need a lot of runs, you know, no matter who's on the mound. And I feel confident with Schwellenbach and all the guys the Braves are going to throw this weekend. But that Dodgers offense is just really, really good. And this Braves offense, and especially in the first couple of innings, it looked like an offense we saw a lot last year, mm-hmm. Grant. And it had me just hoping for just a moment because, I mean, all the at-bats were good early on. Even the outs that they made yeah. in those first couple of innings were really loud. And it's just there were at-bats where a batter would fall behind 0-2, 1-2, and they'd battle back in the account, work it full. And make some good swings. So, I mean, that is the offense that we have been looking for and and are wanting to see on a more consistent basis. And it gives me hope because, again, we saw this a lot last year where the Braves really jumped on teams early. And it just seemed like they went in with a great game plan against the pitcher. I'm hoping that's kind of what we saw here where they just went in with a great game plan against Nack, who's a rookie. Look, he's been the Schwellenbach for the Dodgers. And they really just attacked him and got after him and knocked him out of the game. So, again, I know there's only a couple of weeks left, but I'm hoping that that's some sort of a sign for this offense that just having better, a better game plan coming to the plate, especially against the starter early on and attacking. And really, it's about consistency. I don't think that at any point you or I or really anybody else out there is sitting waiting for this 2024 squad to do the kinds of things that the 2023 team did. They're underpowered in a few regards, and you know maybe they'll be able to do some different things that will allow them to score some runs. And as you mentioned, Having a good plan going to the plate might just be part of that. They, you know, those are the things you can't control, I guess. There's a lot that they haven't been able to control this year, particularly with the injuries, but that doesn't mean that the hard work and the preparation might not be able to help this offense do what I will call just enough to help this pitching staff out, and maybe more than the minimum, which is what it's felt like throughout the month of September. The Braves have played 11 games now. They're 6-5 and five this month. The pitching staff has put in a sub-2 ERA over that stretch, Meanwhile, the offense was batting under 220 coming into this one. They hit some home runs here and there, but as you mentioned, and what I really think is the key is you got to get a few of these guys going, and it would be very nice to see if maybe Jorge Soler is one of those guys. A big home run in this game. Braves hit a lot of balls very hard early on against Landon Knack, but if I had to pick one out that I'm I'm kind of feeling like you need to see a lot more of, I think Jorge Soler is probably that guy. He's the guy they got at the deadline to come over and kind of, you know, spark this offense and help get them going. And outside of 
a couple of good games in Colorado before he obviously got hurt in San Francisco with the hamstring. He hasn't done much for this team since coming over. In fact, you probably make the argument that he is he's hurt the team more than he's helped them a lot with his, his play in, in the outfield. So it's good to see him get going. It's the, it's the bat that they need. Again, it's the bat that they went and got to help get this offense going. So for him, if he can get hot this last couple of weeks of the season, hopefully spark them into the postseason. I mean, you you get, you know, at that point, you get what you what you went out and wanted to accomplish and getting a guy like Solaire, who we know can get on base. And even through yeah. his struggles, he's been able to do that some. But certainly you want to see that power on full display. So that is great to see. And again, being able to get some hits the last couple of games and then a big home run here to really just kind of separate things. You never feel too comfortable against that against that Dodgers offense. But, you know, that home run certainly helped ease a little bit of, of uh, nervousness in the middle part of that game. Yeah, the Braves jumped out and got that inning, uh, that first run uh, in the first inning, which was certainly something you'd like to see. You get a zero from Spencer Schwellenbach. You're able to immediately go to the plate, put a run on the board. Felt like the Braves were, you know, this close to maybe getting another one as uh, Ramon Laureano put a charge into one, and he wasn't the only Braves hitter who got one out to the warning track, basically, before it was dragged in. And I don't know if it was the the weather, the humidity, what it might have been, but it just felt like the Braves were coming up just short which has been a story this season at times. But putting that aside, Gio Urshela removed some doubt. Jorge Soler removed all doubt that the Braves are capable of hitting the ball over the wall as each of them hit two-run home runs in that four-run second inning, something that the Braves very much were happy to see. And it all backed up Spencer Schwellenbach, who did a great job against a tough lineup, three MVPs, and on a sometimes rainy night as well. I mean, I was wondering in the fourth inning if they weren't about you know this close to pulling the tarp had that rain persisted anymore, but it was able to kind of uh, quiet down for a while, came back in and out throughout the course of the night. But for Schwellenbach, he was able to deal with that lineup and deal with the elements and pass yet another test. I mean, it's hard to say because he's been so good, but I feel like this is one of the more impressive performances from Spencer Schwellenbach that we've seen. And we're at a point of season now where, uh, look, if the Braves would have stuck to their plan, I think for him this season, he wouldn't be pitching at this point, but they need him and he's still able to pitch. Well, I know it was a little bit of a struggle uh, before here recently, but in this one, you're facing a Dodgers lineup. It may be one of the best lineups he faces, faces as a oh, professional yeah. hitter. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly this year, but I mean, that is a very dangerous lineup. You're doing it on a rainy night and he's able to get through six innings. And so again, I think it was a very impressive performance for the young kid. Again, after his last outing where he gave up 10 hits yeah. to the blue Jays. So, I thought it was a good bounce back out for him overall. Uh, but again, when you look at the competition and the conditions that he had to pitch in, the fact, he only allowed four hits. I mean, this is it's right up there again. He's had a lot of good starts this year, but just taking all that into consideration and where the Braves are and needing a win and needing a performance like this. Certainly a big start from the rookie. Yeah, and he's given the Braves no shortage of those throughout the course of the year. We'll talk a little bit more about Spencer Schwellenbach as we go along. Braves offense, though, just to go back to that for a moment, because they kind of Stole the show there early. The pitching staff, of course, did what the Braves pitching staff is capable of doing. 349 ERA, meanwhile, for the Braves pitching staff on the year. One of, if not the best in baseball, pretty much pending the outcome of whatever happens in Seattle on a given night. That's how good this club has been. And the Seattle Mariners certainly have also been equally good on the pitching side of things. But Jorge Soler, you mentioned, uh, has gotten some hits here lately. Two on this night, plus a walk. The two-run homer, obviously the big one, scored two runs in this game. Also, three hits for Marcelo Zuna, and congrats to him on his 1,500th career hit. It just goes to show you, he's been playing this game a long time, Jake. He's only about halfway to 3,000, and obviously that's a pretty small and a very exclusive club, but it just goes to show what it takes to do that, but also being able to stick around even get halfway there. There's a lot of big league players that don't make it. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's obviously the longevity of being able to play to reach some of these accomplishments is impressive in itself. And Ozuna, who's, you know, had somewhat of an up and down career uh, throughout, but been able to obviously get things going here with the Braves for the last two seasons now. So great to see that for him. And what's well, been an incredible year for him. And, you know, he's been kind of the power hasn't been there for him as of late, but still able to pick up those hits and three of them on the night. So a good night for him overall. Yeah, and just missed a home run, an absolute yeah. laser beam. I believe it was about 110, 109 miles an hour off the wall, missed by about three feet. Would have been probably the uh, the lowest home run of a line drive variety, but you'll take them if they go over the wall. They all count the same. So good to see that, and congrats to Marcelo Zuna on that little milestone as well. Early offense carried the day for the Braves, and a, a couple more that nearly went out, Laureano and Ozuna, 
on that list. As you look up and down the lineup, there were also uh, some good things to see, including Whit Merrifield back in the lineup. We'll talk a little bit more about him as we go on and the warrior that he is currently being for this Braves club as they're already down their all-star second baseman, Ozzie Albies, who we'll also be talking a little bit more about as we continue on the Braves postcast. When we come back, though, we'll get inside the line score, the box score a little bit more, talk some more about Spencer Swellenbach, what he had going on, and how much he has been a boost for this Braves team throughout the course of the season. All that's coming your way as the Braves postcast continues. For those of us who thrive on getting stuff done, including workouts, every minute counts. That's why you need Tonal. The smart strength training system that takes the guesswork out of working out so you can make sure that you are making the most of every rep. Tonal is the world's smartest, most effective strength training system and helps you get stronger. Powered by AI, Tonal learns with every rep so you can deliver or it can deliver workouts personalized just for you. Tonal learns from your movement, provides suggested weight recommendations for every move with detailed progress reports. They even create personalized programs and workout suggestions and recommendations based on your individual goals. It's like having a personal trainer at home with you as Tonal will optimize every workout just for you. Unlike traditional gym equipment, Tonal uses adaptive digital weight to advance your training techniques. From professional athletes to a mom of three, Tonal is trusted by thousands of folks who have become their strongest. Right now, Tonal is offering our listeners $200 off your Tonal purchase with promo code locked on MLB. That's tonal.com. Use the promo code. It's locked on MLB. You'll get $200 off your purchase. That's tonal.com. Promo code locked on MLB for that $200 off. Well, Jake, let's jump inside the line score and box score of this game. A 6 2 victory for the Braves, who scored a run in the first, four in the second, added one more in the eighth for good measure and picked up their 80th win of the season. Braves now 80 and 67, six runs, 10 hits, no errors. Atlanta left eight men on base. Dodgers, meanwhile, 87 and 60 on the year, two runs, five hits, no errors. They left just three men on base. Not a lot of chances for this Dodgers lineup, particularly at the top of the order. We'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, Landon Knack is the loser in this game, drops to two and four. Spencer Wellenbach is the winner. He's six and seven. And the Braves' bullpen able to close it out with three scoreless innings behind him. No save for Rysel Iglesias, but he just continues to dazzle. And we'll talk about him more in a moment as well. But let's start with Schwellenbach, who we did touch on a little bit in the first segment. But let's get into it a little bit more. A great line for him in this one. Six innings, four hits, two earned runs. Did allow a home run, but just one walk and six strikeouts. And I want to look at the top of the order for the Dodgers, Jake, as we talk about Spencer Schwellenbach, because... If you're able to be part of a group of pitchers on a given night that holds Shohei Otani, Mookie Betts, and Freddie Freeman hitless and allows them to reach base just one time on a walk, you've done pretty well for yourself. You certainly have, and especially as a rookie. And I like his comments after the game, you know, saying he trusts his stuff against anybody and he's going to attack. And it's mm-hmm. exactly what you saw in this one and what you've seen from him pretty much since day one that he's come up. He, he has really good stuff and he knows he can get out the best hitters with it. I mean, good pitching is always going to overtake good hitting but uh certainly with the stuff that he has again and when he has that command of it and able to control it like i thought he did tonight you know he can he can attack anybody and he has that confidence which i think is you know something that's very special about spencer swellenbach a guy that doesn't have a lot of experience uh, pitching at all and to come up and be able to have the confidence to be able to say that and not just say it but do it against as you said three mvps and guys that are probably going to be in the hall of fame one day it's really impressive Yeah, and I think he's facing the National League's MVP at the top of the order. I know there's some discussion going on about that right now. I don't mind telling you if I had a vote. It's just hard for me to overlook the absolute dominance of Shohei Otani this year, considering he's doing all of this, flirting with some history if he gets to 50-50, and we don't have to turn it into that show. But it would be quite something, and he's only, what, three homers and two steals away from doing that heading into the weekend. He's got 15 games left to go. At his pace, I wouldn't put it uh, outside the realm of possibility, and he's rehabbing his uh, elbow surgery and back on the mound doing all that work as well. It just seems like this guy uh, cannot be stopped in a lot of different ways. But he was stopped by St- Spencer Schwellenbach and company uh, on this night. He was 0 for 4 with a couple of strikeouts. Mookie Betts 0 for 4. Freddie Freeman had a walk and a stolen base, but 0 for 3 on the night. And otherwise, you know, the only real offense that the Dodgers were able to muster it's not the guys that you would expect. It was Tommy Edmond and Miguel Rojas who were driving in the runs, but. You know, it's just one of those things where I I guess you'll take that. If you're able to keep the big bats down, you're able to probably stay away from a lot of big innings. And it goes without saying, Jake. I mean, every game, every series has become must win for the Braves at this point. And Spencer Schwellenbach passed yet another test by going up against, as you said earlier, 
maybe his most impressive or his biggest test to date and most impressive outing. But we've also said that quite a few times this year because this is a kid that continues to impress with the confidence, the stuff, and the way that he goes about competing on the mound. And what I love in this one, too, you know, you had that fourth inning. He gives up a run, bit of a long inning. You know you got the top of the order coming up again for a third time here pretty soon. And not only does he go back out and get through the fifth inning, one, two, three, you bring him back out for the sixth inning. Yeah. And he goes one, two, three through Freeman, who, again, MVP. We all know Freddie Freeman, I think, possibly headed to the Hall of Fame task. Hernandez, oh, yeah. who won the home run derby. And Max Muncy, too, who's a big power bat in itself. So that, to me, was just truly impressive that not only – you know, was he able to to pitch well against this team, but to go deep into the game and get through that top of the order a third time, like we mentioned, was really good. And you look at the, the overall stats, too. I mean, it's a 31 percent whip rate. That's very mm -hmm. solid, especially against a good team, a 33 percent called strike plus whip percentage rate, 92 pitches. Only thing I'll say, it's a 92.5 mile per hour average X velocity against that is pretty high for Schwellenbach. We typically see that more in the Max Fried range in the 85s, but it's a good team and it's a good lineup. So you're going to yeah. expect them to make some hard contact against you, but yeah. overall just a great performance from him. And you mentioned the 92 pitches. I feel like being efficient is what allowed him to get through that sixth inning. If he was already pushing 90 plus pitches, I'm not sure they go back out there or he goes back out there in that sixth inning because you do have your bullpen gassed up and ready to go. And clearly they were able to handle the job as well. Offense got it going early against Landon Knack, who was, been one of the many interchangeable pieces for the Dodgers in their starting rotation this year, Jake. They've used 17 different starters. Knack has been pretty good for them. Not his best night against the Braves, though, as he was run after two innings. The four-run second inning in which he allowed a pair of home runs being one of the bigger problems for him in this game. So really what that does, heading into the weekend, heading into this four-game series, it has forced the Dodgers to kind of burn through their bullpen a little bit. I know they didn't have to use everybody but they had to go ahead and cover seven innings in that first game. We'll see if that starts to stack up over time. The Braves, meanwhile, able to use three pitchers, one inning apiece. Pretty easy work for them, and all of those little things kind of add up in a particularly close and important series like this one could very well be. Yeah, the only only thing I'll say is that I wish they'd have scored a little bit more against in those middle innings against the relievers so that you didn't have to use at least Iglesias in the ninth, and you almost didn't as they started to get Grant Holmes up. But, I mean, it's certainly the first game of a four-game series, and you're able to burn five pitchers on the other team or not burn them. These guys can certainly come back, but make them use that. It's, it's definitely to your advantage. So great job by the offense to, like I said, jump out early against Knack. Good game plan they had against them. They executed it. But they frustrated him as well, taking some close pitches. The umpire was giving a little bit off the outside yep. corner to right-handed hitters early on, and you kind of established that early. But either way, I thought the Braves did a good job fouling some of those pitches off. You mentioned what Merrifield. I want to talk about him a little bit more, too, because what he did in that ninth inning, too, getting that add-on run, playing mm -hmm. with the, in the pitcher a little bit, getting – uh, that ball call to go to second and then scoring on the Michael Harris hit. I mean, that's just the little things that a veteran like Witt can do. Also had the infield hit earlier, yeah. just putting the ball in play and running it out. So just good to have him back in the lineup. And like you said, the warrior guy, just coming back out there playing with a hurt foot like that. You know it's, yep. he's going to be in pain and be able to fight through that and help this team. All right. I was going to get to him a little bit more later on, but yeah, it's good to have him back in. The Braves certainly could use him. And we'll obviously discuss what the uh, the future is or is not for Ozzy Albies, depending on which 15-minute interval you check social media today. You might have noticed that there was some question about it and then maybe not as much of a question about it, but we will get into that. But Whit Merrifield, playing through a broken foot, gets a pair of hits, including, of course, in his first one, an infield hit, because why wouldn't he have to leg it out to get that first single? Uh, but great to see that and important to have him back out there. And I do think that that kind of mentality – that can certainly help kind of drive the team because you look around and you see everybody is trying to pull their weight and then some. And talking to Whit Merrifield before the game, he said, look, man, I'm 35 years old. I don't, I've played a lot of September games that haven't meant very much. The opportunity for me and for this team, what we need to do, what we want to do to get back out there, that's my job to be ready and to get back out there. And I don't know how many more of these chances I'm going to get. So yeah, I'm out here. I'm going to play on the broken foot. He also said, that he's not looking to get a bunch of painkiller injections or anything like that. He's just going to grin and bear it and push his way through. And that, I think, uh, just tells you a little bit more about just the toughness of Whit Merrifield. Certainly does. And again, it's that type of attitude and that veteran leadership and mentality that I think you know goes a long way for a team that's in a race like this. And obviously, they know they've been underperforming a lot this year, especially in the offensive side. So to have that presence like a Whit Merrifield and to see what he's out there doing, trying to will this team 
you know, to the postseason, to a good finish here. I think that says a lot, you know, for the rest of the team being one of that leader. Everybody always asks me who's the leader in that clubhouse. And I think it can vary from day to day. Yeah. But certainly a guy like Wood Merrifield can be one of those guys in there uh, to help kind of inspire this team and get them going. Yeah, this has been a team that it, it's been more than about just one person. There are a lot of different guys that you expect a lot out of and that expect a lot out of each other and are able to do things on a given night to pick each other up. And that's been you know, something the Braves have been pretty good at, but it's been a more challenging year when you consider some of the players that they've been down and how are they going to face that kind of adversity. Brian Snicker said it before the game. I mean, this is a club that hasn't spent one day feeling sorry for itself. It just goes back out there and continues to battle. Obviously, the pitching's been a big part of it, but if they can get something going here over this final couple of weeks, maybe they can have some kind of at least consistency. It may not be the world-beater offense we saw a year ago, but some consistency in their run scoring. With this pitching staff, you can get hot for the right three weeks out of the year, and it could be a pretty special thing. I guess it had to be four weeks for the Braves this year, but semantics, that is what it is. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit about the playoff picture, the wild card race, where the Braves are in that, some other goings on across baseball, and of course, uh, an update on Ozzy Albies, who was busy prior to this game. Will he be busy with the Braves sooner than later? We will talk about that as the Braves postcast continues. Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. Get in on the daily action with your friends and become part of the Prize Picks community today. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000. Prize Picks is available coast to coast in more than 30 states from California to Georgia. Download the Prize Picks app today. Use the code Locked On MLB. You'll get a first deposit match of up to $100. $100. That's code locked on MLB on prize picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It is that easy with prize picks. Well, Jake, let's take a look at what's happening in the wild card race. We know that coming down the stretch, there were going to be some tests for all of the teams that are in action and fighting for, well, the four teams fighting for the three wild card spots in the National League. The Padres actually trail the Diamondbacks now. Thanks to Arizona surging back ahead there. But Arizona, San Diego, New York, the Mets, and then the Braves in that order. But a separation of what? Three games, three and a half games between these four teams leads to a lot of intrigue over the final couple of weeks. Phillies, though, who who are going to be playing the Mets seven times before the Braves and Mets meet up uh, at Truist Park uh, not too long from now. They did not help the Braves out. Aaron Nola got blasted and the Phillies uh, lost big to the Mets. So the Braves remained one game back for that third wild card. But uh, while one game might be a kind of impressive win, the Mets also got a little bit of an injury scare with Francisco Lindor. Doesn't sound like anything serious with some back tightness, but this time of year, all kinds of things are going on and uh, the days are ticking down and one by one by one, we're going to see which teams are able to make the most of this next couple of weeks. And, if the Phillies could, for whatever reason, decide they want to help the Braves out. Yeah, it'd be great if they would. But either way, the Braves, I, I've said all along, if they just take care of their business, you know, I think they'll be okay. But certainly they're on the outside looking in at the moment because they didn't really take care of their business as well as they should have at the beginning of the month. But, you know, obviously with the Mets on their schedule, they have it in front of them to be able to to do what they need to do to get into the postseason. But it's it's four teams. I think it's four good teams. Uh, yeah, I, I think the Diamondbacks offense is really, really good. Padres are loaded with talent and the Mets are just a really hot team right now. And Lindor is a big part of that. So again, hopefully for the Mets sake that he is okay. And it's nothing serious because you mentioned Otani and I agree. I think he's, he's the MVP just because what he's doing is historic. It'd be hypocritical for me not to say that after we said last year, you know, what Ronald's doing is historic and why he should win that. But I do think Lindor, you know, being an everyday player playing shortstop, what he's done for that Mets team that, you know, who knows where they would be without Lindor and the contributions sure. that he has made. Uh, certainly, you know, they need to have him and he's been a big part of their, their surge, but they're a team that's just playing with a lot of confidence. So it's going to be a tough battle for the Braves down the stretch here. They're going to have to get going. They're going to have to get hot. And we just, we really haven't seen that as much as we would like to this year, uh, yeah. but you know, they're, they're certainly capable of doing it. Yeah. I mean, the Braves over the last, what, 30 games now have a sub three ERA from their pitching staff, including, I think going back over the last 15, it's about 230. And then this month, it is under two. But the Braves have not really been able to win as consistently as they've needed to, despite that great pitching. The Mets, meanwhile, have had one of the better records in baseball since way back in June. They had a disastrous month of May. I mean, there was reason to believe 
if you were optimistic at all about their April, that the May had kind of sunk their season, but that is not the case. And Francisco Lindor is a big reason why. Really slow start, but has come on lately, and we won't turn it into much of an MVP debate. I think there's still plenty of time to figure it out over the final couple of weeks, but if the best player on the planet having one of the best seasons anybody's ever seen doesn't win an MVP, then I don't know what does. That's not a knock on Francisco Lindor or anybody else. There's somebody on every team that's going to the postseason that you can point at and say, without that guy, where would they be? For us, it's been Marcelo Zuna or Chris Sale most nights. But aside from that, I do think it's going to be fascinating to see how much the team dynamic plays into it or if the superstar and historic numbers thing is going to win out the way that it certainly did for Ronald Acuna Jr., it doesn't hurt, though, that much like Ronald did last year, Otani is playing for a club that could end up with the best record in the National League. So take that for what you will. All of that aside, Braves still very much chasing the Mets by one game here in this wild card. We'll see if Lindor is able to get back in action this weekend for New York. And we'll see what happens. The Padres and Diamondbacks in action late. Padres and Giants this weekend as the Diamondbacks against the central leading Brewers. So that could also uh, bode well for the Braves or the Mets as they try to make a move up in those wild card standings. But four teams within what three or four games of one another for most of this month going to be pretty fascinating to see what this finish is. As far as the other things that the Braves are very much uh, watching, uh, the return of Ozzy Albies could be uh, closer than we imagined when the day even started. Uh, down at the clubhouse today, Ozzy Albies went out to do his work. Didn't have a lot to say before that. Afterwards, though, he was able to shed a little bit of light on the fact that he's still not swinging the bat well from the left side, just not comfortable with that, but may just say, hey, I'm going to hit right-handed because I can. I'm a switch hitter and come back and try to get back on the field and help this club out. He's been doing all of the other things. I still haven't seen him take live batting practice yet. He said he may only need a game of a rehab assignment. I don't know if they'd like to stretch that to two, if they're going to push it that far, but that all came after talking to Brian Snitker, who said, I don't really have an update on Ozzy. And he was even asked, do you think Ozzy will play again this year? And he said, honestly, I don't know. But that all just got very confusing, very convoluted. And it was all pretty much put to bed within about 30 minutes. So if you logged on to any of your social media between about 4.30 and 5.30, you might have had a wild ride. But it sounds like Ozzy Albies is going to be back and perhaps sooner than later for the Braves as soon as he can get cleared to go out on that rehab assignment. Yeah, good news, obviously, for the Braves, getting a bat like Ozzy Albies back, even if it is just batting right-handed. And you look at it, Grant, 14 at-bats right on right in his career, 5 for 14 with three home runs. Now, very small sample size. I think a lot of those are against, you know, some position players, or some of those at least are against position players. But, uh, you know, either way, you get a bat like Ozzy back in the lineup, you know, what he brings to the team. He's one of those leaders that we talked about earlier, uh, just one of those guys. So certainly we'll be glad to have him back if he is healthy and ready. And that's something that I think probably still needs to be determined over the next week or so. Certainly don't want to rush it back. Yeah, he's at the end of the eight weeks of the suggested time that it was going to take for him to heal. And obviously, that's a fluid situation. They hope that he'd be back at the start of the month. He just wasn't ready for that. And now they're hoping that he could be back sometime soon. What will that mean as far as time frame is concerned? You know, Where will Merrifield find his events? Uh, pretty good question because as we just talked about a little bit earlier, and I'm not saying it should come at the expense of Ozzy Albies, but Whit Merrifield's doing everything he can to get out there on the field, and you've got to appreciate that. And he's been a nice contributor in the absence of Albies as well. Putting all that aside, because the Braves would love to have difficult decisions about having too many players at positions, because I don't think that's happened since way back in February or March, uh, the Braves are going to put Chris Sale on the mound into the test against the L.A. Dodgers as he looks to continue his incredible season against Jack Flaherty, who's a tough customer as well, picked up at the trade deadline from the Tigers where he was pitching well, and has come over to try to help uh, stabilize a very, very unstable position or uh, unstable position in the uh, starting rotation for the Dodgers. Sale 16 and three with a 2.38 ERA on the year. Flaherty's 12 and six with a 2.86 himself. Looks like the strikeouts are back for him. There could be a lot of those on the menu between Sale and the Dodgers right-hander on Saturday. Going to be a tough matchup, obviously. I mean, I obviously haven't paid too much attention to the Dodgers rotation. Flaherty might be their game one starter in the postseason. I mean, Yamamoto, maybe it's he's working his way back, but uh, Flaherty's been that good. It's been a, a, a bounce back year for him after a couple of, of rough seasons and some injuries, and he's a guy that maybe get paid uh, yeah. this offseason. But uh, you're going to be a tough start, obviously, for a tough assignment for the Braves offense after a good night on Friday, but you do have your – your horse and Chris Sale on the mound. Hopefully he'll be able to pitch, pitch another great game for you, give you a chance to win as he typically always does. 
Yep, Sale has been that guy for the Braves. He's been the best pitcher in the National League, if not all of baseball this year, and I think everybody has started to notice that as the season has worn on. Chris Sale is healthy, and it looks like he had quite a few things to prove and has done a great job of that over the first five months, but obviously looking to pitch uh, the Braves into position for the postseason where he could pile up a few more at rather important innings, which he has done in his career a time or two. It's Sale against Flaherty, 7.20 p.m. Eastern time, the first pitch, game two of four, between the Braves and Dodgers at Truist Park. That brings us to the end of this edition of the Braves Postcast. As always, we appreciate you riding along with us. Make sure to subscribe to Locked On Sports Atlanta here on YouTube and Locked On Braves wherever you get your podcast. For Jake Mastriani, I'm Grant McCauley. We'll be back with you this weekend as the Braves and Dodgers continue their series. And until then, so long, everyone.